Welcome back to The Bulwark Goes to Hollywood. My name is Sonny Bunch. I'm culture editor at The Bulwark. Uh, and I'm very pleased to be joined today by Suzanne Jo Kai, uh, who is the director of Like a Rolling Stone, The Life and Times of Ben Fong Torres. Now, uh, folks who... I, I, I'm going to say something here, and I feel, I feel like this is... The whole point of the documentary is to actually refute this conception of Ben Fong Torres. But I feel like a lot of people who uh, who, who don't know necessarily the early history of Rolling Stone um, weren't, you know, early subscribers, uh, you know, aren't aren't really in touch with the whole music journalism scene. Think Ben Fong Torres and they think, oh, yeah, the guy from Almost Famous. Um, and it feels to me like your documentary is like, no, he's more than that guy. He is he is. This is the this is the guy behind the guy. And uh, I I learned so much watching this documentary. It's on Netflix now. Uh, you can watch it after after listening to this or before listening to this. Stop listening now. Go watch it uh, and come back. Uh, but it is a it's a really interesting documentary. Suzanne, thank you for being on the show. I really appreciate it. I love. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, so let's let's talk uh, let's talk a little bit about how you got uh, uh, attracted to this project. What was it about uh, Ben Fong Torres that jumped out to you and was like, you know what, we need to tell his story in full? I think part of it was just uh, serendipity. Uh, ben, both of us were working journalists uh, in the San Francisco Bay Area, and there's so few of us uh, who look like us, Asian Americans. Uh, you could probably count the number on one hand across America. And so that's how we initially knew about each other. And then I think years later, Ben, I, then I moved from San Francisco Bay Area to Southern California. And then Ben said, hey, I'm going to have a meeting with Q. And do you have time to, to meet afterwards? And of course I said, yes. And so we meet afterwards. And I actually was filming on the red carpet to help uh, a startup called Rotten Tomatoes. <laughs> they're really good, good friends of mine. But they're uh, so uh, I brought my uh, 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 cinematographer with me uh, for the dinner. So over dinner, I, I'm just asking him, "Hey Ben, you're in everyone else's rock and roll documentary. Why isn't there one about you?" And then he thought about it. He says, "Well, why don't you just do one?" And that's how it all came to being. And I thought. Yeah, that would be really nice. It's kind of this fun, you know, entertaining rock and roll. And uh, I just thought, that sounds really good. And so I started. And then I thought, that's that's really, that's all I had was just that concept. Then I started to do the deep dive, like all journalists uh, should do, and I did. <laughs> and then I realized, whoa, Almost everything, every interview I was doing with sources inside Rolling Stone, inside the music industry, inside the community, inside, you know, friends and family, it was not anywhere. And I actually blocked myself out for a couple of years. I didn't want to read anything. I didn't want to see anything because I didn't want to be influenced by accident, you know, um, subconsciously. And it was a revelation. And then I decided, whoa, this has to be done. And originally I thought it'd be kind of a fun little short film but no <laughs> yeah yeah i mean I, what what jumps out to me uh as as the documentary starts um and this is a great little this is a great little technique that you use just him going through his audio cassette tapes of interviews he has this he has a big you know filing cabinet style uh cabinet that is just filled with tapes of interviews like with jim morrison the last interview that jim morrison gave before he he went to Paris, uh, you know, the uh, interviews with, I, I mean, er, everybody. How many, I, I, I want to, the thing I, the note I wrote down during the segment was, how many of those tapes did you listen to? Did you listen to all of them? Were you were you just going through and like, here's, we got to, we got to listen to Marvin Gaye. We got to listen to everybody. What, what was, what was that like? Well, <clears throat> the, uh, he actually pre-selected just, you know, what he thought were, were great. And I, uh, living in Southern California, here I am in San Francisco in his basement with him, and I'm hand carrying these on the airplane. I wouldn't even let security uh, let them go through security; it had to be hand checked. Mm -hmm. So they're so precious and so fragile, and I wanted to recover them, you know, because he didn't know if actually, you know, you're talking about 40, 50 plus years. So I would hand carry them to a restoration uh, company, and I would just be right there as they were trying to recover them so 
uh, it was a very, very um, uh, incredible process, I would say. <laughs> uh, and then we would transcribe manually everything. There was nothing uh, left our, our um, operation. It was all done by ourselves. And so we transcribed everything uh, and, and uh, we just really protected, protected his tapes. Yeah. So, yes. <laughs> well, the, you mentioned the restoration. What was that process like? Because I, I was listening to it and I was shocked by how good it sounded. I mean, it, 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 it you know, it did not sound like uh, audio off of a 50 year old audio cassette that you get from the local drugstore. You know, it sounded it sounded really good. What was it? Did you have to go to, you know, a professional restorationist to be like, we need to get this and, and make it listenable so yes. people people can hear it? Yes. Yes. These are like these people are the best in the industry and it's all kind of word of mouth, you know, <laughs> um, I actually used another group also best in the industry in Los Angeles. Uh, but, uh, for this, this is much, they were, it was much closer to me. So I could go back and forth and, and work with them. So they have, uh, years and years of experience on how to try to restore, uh, uh, audio, video, all of that. So, so I was very, very lucky to have such experts. Yeah. Do we? Uh, do you want to give them a shout out? We can uh, help help that word of mouth or digital or is arts. It all in... Digital arts plus. Digital okay. arts plus. <laughs> Great. Yeah. No. I mean, it sounds. I. I. Again, it. It really is. Uh. It's like being there with Jim Morrison in the room. I mean, it's. It's. It's crazy. Uh. How good this. This stuff sounds. Um. So. Uh. So you're. You're going through these tapes and. Uh, you know, he, he gives you the ones to listen to. What, what are you looking for to pull out when you're, when you're going through as a, as a journalist and as a, uh, as a documentarian, what was it, what was it that jumped out to you about some of these, uh, these recordings? I think that first we, we kind of, well, I, I mapped all, all of the transcripts and everything and just to get an understanding what was in that first collection. And, uh, then I would write, uh, before that even, I would write what I thought what might be a basic storyline. And, and then I would try to figure out what would be relational, you know, uh, sound uh, audio recordings that would work within the, the structure of Ben's story. And so that's how we, uh, or how, how I began. And surprisingly, you know, years later, uh, it actually, I'm looking at some of my very ancient, very old years ago notes, and it basically the structure has been very, uh, pretty much stayed together. Uh, mm -hmm. Because, for example, you have Paul McCartney talking about, um, you know, they're kind of growing up together uh, and then getting married and all uh, that section. And so that, I thought, that would be perfect, you know, when Ben gets married to his wife, Diane. So right in that area, uh, we we tested it there. And so those are the kinds of things that we put, you know, uh, uh, different segments related to Ben's life story. Mm -hmm. How long were you working on this? I mean, this definitely, uh, <laughs> it definitely feels like a, a long time labor of love here. You know, it, 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 uh, longer than I thought, I thought it was a two year project tops, you know, like I, I did a documentary, uh, for back in the day, uh, for KRON TV when it was at the uh, NBC station, San Francisco. And so all, I'm all of like, what, 20 something uh, years old, 22 probably. And uh, what a luxury. They guess in the newsroom, you know, we have to do multiple stories in a single day under deadline. Um, they gave me six weeks. Oh my gosh, you know. <laughs> but in this case, um, I decided there's just too much about Ben's true story that I felt was uh, needed to be understood and and uh, chronicled and and I did more than something like 120 film shoots. You're talking about lugging, you know, tons of gear in, setting up all of that, you know, in different parts of the country. So um, it took at least 12 years. <laughs> wow. wow, that is wow, including COVID. Yeah. So yeah, so it, it it took a long time, but looking in hindsight they're literally it took it took at least that much time to get it to, to get his true story yeah uh you, you mentioned his true story and i that is a huge part of this you know it's not just 
interviews with celebrities and and famous musicians and comedians like Steve Martin, Elton John, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, it's it is really the story of a family. It's the story of a uh, a a a family that comes to America and and you know uh, has trouble and success and finds itself in the middle of the zeitgeist. Uh, and the way the way that you get into it, the way you kind of transition into it, I thought was really very lovely. The discussion of of Ben Fong Torres' name, like his actual name, and the confusion some people had with it, and you know where where do where does this all come from? Can you tell me about about how you how you settled on that structure and also. Just talk about that that as a as a framing device for for that that part of the the, the film. Um, regarding his name, that is probably the first time I've ever heard somebody talk about their their parents coming over uh, with uh, uh, circumventing you know the U.S. laws. <laughs> Let's say that, yeah. and usually that's kind of a serious note. But it's the first time I've ever heard. Uh, that told with humor and the, the entire audience is laughing with, <laughs> with Ben. And I thought, wow, that is really great. So my objective uh, overall is if, when you see the film, actually uh, it's, it's actually has one screening at the center for Asian American uh, at cam fest, uh, May 21st. Uh, and the live screenings, you can hear the audience laugh throughout the entire film. It's really fun and and humorous, and then there's some very sad, a few sad parts, you know, where people you can actually see people weeping, real tears, and and then it ends on a, an inspiring note. So um, my objective, uh, and this was actually a point that was mentioned at the Producers Guild of America, Power of Diversity. Uh, um, it's a fellowship by the Producers Guild, and we were very very lucky to win a, a seat in that fellowship um, back, I think back in 2016. And they were saying that we picked all of you, pro all of you with your projects because you have the potential, your projects have the potential of being part of positive social change. And um, <clears throat> we're going to support you. And they actually, the Producers Guild is, is, is even supporting uh, our film today. I mean, it's, it's incredible. So there is a human element that we can portray and actually be a, a part of social change in changing um, stereotypes and that sort of thing. And now with the rise of Asian racism, you know, the, this is even more important. Yeah. Yeah, well, let's talk. All right, so let's talk about his his family coming to America. I mean, there's there's a it's it's a it's a really interesting look at you know stuff we don't really talk about very much the Chinese Exclusion Act and 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 that sort of thing. So how how did how did his family uh, get here and and where how did they end up in uh, a place where Torres could you know go on to be a you know famous rock journalist. Basically, um, his father uh, came over from China as a very young person. I would say probably uh, maybe about 20 years old. He immigrated to the Philippines, hoping to find a, uh, a life that he can help his family back home in China. And then he discovered, and, and what was going on in China at the time was there was famine and there was war. And uh, it was just a struggle to, to survive. And so... So he, he went on his way to the Philippines, discovered that it, it was, life was also difficult for him at that time. And then he discovered, oh, I, I can come to America as uh, if, if I purchase a, uh, somebody's name from the Philippines. Yeah. So he immigrated to America as Ricardo Torres. <laughs> so so that, that, that is a name that he, he basically acquired his father. And that that Ben actually did not know that, or nor did the other children and his, uh, his brothers and sisters, until years later. I guess the family was just so protective of not talking about it, you know, <laughs> for for many years. And then he discovers later, you know, oh, yeah. so that's how we got our name. <laughs> Yeah, like I said, it's a really it's a really interesting entree into this section where where we're talking about you know where does this name come from uh, and. It is. It's. It's a unique name. I mean, I think people. People when they were reading Rolling Stone for the first time were like, "Well, who is this guy? Who? Who is he?" 
Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. That we had a lot of fun. We had a lot of fun with uh, his name, and and uh, he actually has this really cool uh, montage uh, of all the different people writing to him back in uh, the day at Rolling Stone, and they would misspell his name, and it was really hilarious. <laughs> yeah, uh, it it's a great moment. Again, it, when you when you watch the movie, it's it's very interesting to see. Um, those envelopes with, that he has, I guess, kept for these, you know, 50, 50 some years, uh, and, and has held on to, he does. I mean, he seems to have, he'd be a, like one man repository of knowledge and artifacts. Um, when you were, when you were going through his house, what were you kind of most surprised or, or shocked to find? I would say his collection of archives. Uh, in fact, when he invited me to do the film, I knew that there probably had to be archives, but I didn't know to what extent. And it took some months later that I basically uh, was taken to look at the archives. And and that was really quite, quite an amazing collection. And it still is, actually. I still am flying little bits, you know, more back uh, every time I see him, because, you know, we're, we're, uh, we have future plans for the film as well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, it feels like the sort of thing that needs to be in a, you know, university somewhere almost, you know, the, the letters, the papers of, of Ben Fong Torres, it really is a, it's a window into a different time. And that's, uh, you know, that's, a, a friend of mine says the best thing about the movies is it can transport you somewhere else. It can take you to someplace else, some other time. And that is really what this movie does. It takes you back to America and specifically, you know, Northern California in the, in the 1960s, late sixties, early seventies. Um, and it's fascinating to see this kind of confluence of politics, culture, uh, art, and everything else coming together all at once all in all in the, I mean almost in the personage of this man I mean just walking this the photos of him and his outfits are so perfect and so great and so transporting um you know what was I I, I, I don't even really have a question here I just want I'm just gushing uh what was it what was it like talking to him about this this time in America and what it was like to live through all that it was really incredible you know I've known Ben for many years and Ben has this big personality yet he's extremely humble and so it was a lot of uh basically asking him and tr trying to get as much as i could on camera so we we filmed him any way we could in the car walking down the street you know and just so we can get him to go beyond his you know he's a radio he's a really great radio broadcaster he's a great television broadcaster as well so he's very polished. So, but I was looking for the Ben underneath that. So uh, occasionally uh, we would hit it. Oh my gosh, there's there's the other part of you know the the, the uh, still polished of course, but there's another layer of Ben there. So, yeah. So it took a while for me to um, to delve into to uh, to find uh, all those different levels of Ben. You seem to hit it uh, when you're discussing his brother Barry, which yes. is a, a very sad uh, story. What? What? Uh, well, tell us what what happened there with with his brother. His this was a time when when uh, the youth revolution uh, was rising up. It, it began actually in 1964 with the free speech movement, UC Berkeley, and then it continued for years after, like I would say, almost a decade, and uh that it spread from the free speech movement spread instantly like very rapidly from uc berkeley across the bay to san francisco state where ben was a student uh, and also uh, uh managing the college student newspaper as the uh, managing editor so he was very well aware of all of that going on and so the youth this is right smack in the middle of this uh youth revolution so you're right. The culturally, it was an explosion of, 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 of uh, uh, principles telling the truth. You know, uh, there there was this uh, anti-war movement, of course, and then then years later we discover yes, uh, the government actually was 
kind of skewing the news so it sounded positive when in fact it might not have been. <laughs> and so that's what uh, Rolling Stone was trying to do is dig and dig and dig as real journalists, you know, telling, trying to dig for the truth. So that, that Ben was leading that along with the uh, uh, co-founder, uh, Jan Wenner, both of them very, very young, but very, very um, uh, really principled on, on uh, ethics of fact finding. Yeah. Yeah. Winner's an interesting guy. I mean, it, like he found Rolling Stone essentially either right after college or maybe during college years. I can't I, I can't remember exactly how old he was, but I mean, he was exceptionally young, you know, 22, something like that. Yes. Yes. Uh, and it becomes this, you know, f cultural force uh, in part because of folks like Ben Funk Doors who could, you know, actually write the things that needed to be written. And there's an interesting there's an interesting part in the documentary where he's talking about how uh, the music companies were, you know, trying to, you know, they would try to bribe him or they would, you know, they would, you know, be like, hey, maybe you fly out to New York. We'll put you up in a hotel. What was I mean, that's almost the Wild West time of music promotion. That is, you know, there were crazy things happening all the time, but he didn't really go for any of that. Right. He did not. He did not. And I'm really glad I actually found that archival uh, footage of him. And it took me years to find uh, to find it and nail it down. And yes, absolutely. He definitely is, is a person of principle in telling the truth and fact finding. And no, he couldn't be swayed. And I, I got that from many people, people in the music industry, uh, just just all across the board. Yeah. I mean, it, it, again, it's such a fascinating time and confluence of talent. Uh, you, you have Wenner, of course, a bunch of interviews with him, but also Annie Leibovitz, you know, arguably one of the two or three most famous photographers in the United States over the last, you know, century. Uh, what was it like talking to her? Did she have uh, were you able to go through her archives and find photos of her and Ben? I mean, what was what was that process like? That was uh, just really, really that moment in time where we could capture Annie and Ben together uh, was really, really, first of all, it was very rare because she's very busy. And also second, that we were able to get, get her on camera. You know, it took yeah. me a long time for Elsa to get that. And she was very, very gracious. And um, the archives of the, uh, her, her uh, photographs um, actually, Ben already had some in his private collection, uh, and they actually granted us permission to use in our film. And so we're very, very fortunate. And then we'd have other people saying, oh, I just went, uh, I just visited Annie and I went through some of her archives and I found one with Ben and Marvin Gaye. So we would ask about that when that's how that all happened. It, it was all with warm care and, you know, friendship it was really wonderful yeah 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 you know nailing down rights and all that is is the like kind of dirty grimy side of you know making a documentary that like it's the nuts and bolts you gotta you gotta get all this stuff done how, how i, I want to talk a little bit about the actual making of of the documentary because i do find this all very fascinating just from a business perspective i mean were were there things that you wanted to get that you couldn't get permission for was there uh, was there, was there any, were there any big fights with people like, well, we want to use this, but you can't, you know, how did that, how did that work out for you? Uh, I think maybe I'm one of the lucky ones and, and our film is one of the very lucky ones. It was really an outpouring from photographers, from, uh, archive, uh, people, uh, pr private collections, uh, from Rolling Stone staff. It was really out of, uh, love for Ben, friendship to Ben, that they wanted to help. And it was extraordinary. I, I can't think of a single instance where they said, uh, I know I can't. <laughs> yeah. it, was, it was like, yes, I can. It was extraordinary. It was really, really extraordinary. Oh, that's great. That's good. That's always nice to hear. Because um, you, you do sometimes hear these horror stories of like, well, we want to use this, you know, iconic photo like okay you can use that but it's like 30 grand like well i'm a documentarian i don't have thirty thousand dollars <laughs> for the rights to this image but that's very nice to hear that is great you know speaking of speaking of money i mean this this is a long-term project as you say i mean this and and you know even if you even if you get all the rights for free and you everybody agrees to sit down and talk with you for for no compensation it is still a time-consuming 
cost intensive process, just getting around places, just, you know, finding the time to do the work. How did you what did you do to line up funding to help, you know, uh, make this a financially feasible project? Oh, uh, that's a very, very good question. And it's still actually ongoing. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, we were really, I was really lucky to have uh, early advice uh, from people who are, have been raising money for their own films. And they said, Suzanne, if you try to do this crowdfunding, which is wonderful, uh, you'll never make it. <laughs> and I yeah. said, oh, really? No, you have to go to the foundations, the uh, the family foundations, you know, and you just go one to one with them. And so I had really, really great executive producers who did exactly that and just really, really lucky. And so we were able to raise uh, funds to, to make the film. Uh, plus, I probably put in most of the funds myself. And it, it's an expensive project, it turns out. I tried to bring it under, 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 you know, uh, budget uh, because I've not paid a penny to myself, for example, all these years. Uh, but it turned out pretty much exactly what people thought it would cost <laughs> Yeah. at this point. Yeah. Well, I, that's interesting to hear you say that about crowdfunding, because uh, a lot of the times I hear from folks, oh, crowdfunding is a it's a godsend. You know, it's it's money from the sky. You know, it's it's really wonderful. But I I I, I have always kind of wondered if that is actually true. I mean, I what what was it uh, that why did people warn you off of the, the crowdfunding route? Um, I think because of, of what they uh, saw as an average not to say our film is average or any other film, but they said average, you're going to work really hard to do the crowdfunding and then uh, you will achieve probably in this range. And when you could actually be talking with the foundations and the, but actually I would like to do a crowdfunding campaign soon because that is probably when you do it near the end and just welcome other people if they want to join in and feel good about participating, you know, with our film. So. Yeah. So that's that's not an option that I, I have said no to. It's just that that's kind of later, later, which is probably yeah. now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, that makes sense. I mean, that makes sense. Like you go to a foundation and you get a check for twenty five thousand dollars instead of, you know, spending six months to raise twenty five thousand dollars. It makes it makes more sense. What what has it been like working with Netflix? I mean, are they just distributing in the United States like or is it worldwide? How how has that process worked? Uh, Netflix uh, is for English speaking countries and it is for uh, uh, I actually just signed it a, about a week ago so I, I <laughs> and I decided let's just go let's just roll yeah. and so um, uh, it's 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 fairly short term you know uh, and uh, it, it's a license. So, okay. And then, okay. then we've got to go out to other, uh, non English speaking countries and then, uh, work with those, uh, foreign distributors. So if anyone knows any foreign <laughs> distributors, let me know, let us know. <laughs> All of my German and Polish listeners. I have lots in Germany and Poland for some reason. Let us know. We'll, we'll get you set up there. Um, I, uh, I, uh, that it's interesting to hear that about Netflix. Cause I'm always, I'm always really fascinated to know, uh, how how filmmakers feel about the Netflix process because it there is a kind of two edged sword here right which is that a you know your your this movie will now be in whatever the number is ninety three million homes in the United States in theory and it, like basically anyone in the United States can watch it more or less if they want to at the same time there is so much stuff on Netflix that there is a fear of it getting kind of lost in the shuffle right. Absolutely. You know, what's amazing. I mean, to me, it's hard to fathom because I just, you know, it's, it's still been nonstop every day, deadlines and everything. And, and I just now beginning to take a deep breath, you know, even though it, it launched officially Friday, uh, yeah. but our executive producers and others who are really tuned in to online tracking and they're saying, oh my gosh, you know, our film is actually trending. And I said, what is it? What does trending mean? It's it's breaking out into a very wide general audience, and uh, then they uh, people from all over the country are sending me their their screenshots of what they're getting, you know, uh, promoted to them, and nobody knows that they are even related, you know, like even to Rolling Stone, and it shows that Ben's film is is ranking at the top, you know, it's like full on 
full on screen uh, of, uh, of, of band film. And then you can actually, uh, it just starts rolling into a little preview of Ben's yeah. film. And then at the very bottom, oh, and here are the other films that we also recommend. <laughs> so that has been a, a quite a, um, amazing for me in just um, this past you know, week, just past yeah. few days, you know. That's interesting. I wonder. I wonder what part of the algorithm is picking it up. If it's you know, like if it's people who have watched uh, like uh, Martin Scorsese's documentary about Bob Dylan that's on the that's on the service or or other stuff. I wonder how that works. The, the The whole Netflix thing is fascinating to me. Like I said, because it does have this immense reach, and it is a total black box in terms of like what is breaking out. Why is it breaking out? Um, but I hope this breaks out. Uh, I'm trying. We're doing our part here uh, because it is a. It's a really interesting. Show one one thing I uh, one thing that did that jumped out at me as, as slightly funny was the Chiron that you used to introduce Cameron Crow, uh, which is former Rolling Stone reporter. Yes, not <laughs> not director, you know, not you know, but uh, but former Rolling Stone reporter, which was which was which was very funny to me. And I I what he he had I mean it seemed like he had done a lot of prep to to sit down with with you and Ben because he had a whole list of of stuff there. Uh, what was it What was it like talking to him? He's incredible. He's actually so incredible. He is just uh, such a beautiful person. Really, really is. Um, I can't say enough about how amazing Cameron Crowe is. And yes, we did put the lower third, you know, as a former Rolling Stone reporter because that that is that is true, actually. And everyone knows wow. he's he's this famous filmmaker, also, of course. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yes, he's um, he loves our film, which I'm thrilled, and he he enjoyed it so much. He personally came out in the middle of COVID to personally introduce our film at a live screening in Los Angeles. Oh, that's great! It's nice. I uh, I love to hear that. All right, so let's I, one last one last thing before before we go here. I mean, this is a movie about. It is a movie about the importance of representation in media. I think that's it's it's that's one of the that is a very clear and important part of this. Um, for you, what are your what are your hopes uh, in terms of uh, reaching audiences who might not have ever thought of themselves as journalists or as filmmakers? What 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 is your hope there? I think yes, that is part of it. The other part is we're facing our country. I feel is so upside down right now. Uh, there's so much anger and uh, overt racism. I, I don't think I've seen this in my entire life. So my hope is that we're going to entertain people when they come. They're going to laugh and they're maybe a little, you know, cry a little bit and then they'll laugh. And I'm seeing that consistently through our live screenings. So they're have, they'll have a really fun time uh, watching the film, whether on Netflix or, or uh, in person. And... I hope this reaches all people because uh, on a human level, we're introducing someone who looks like me, Ben Fong Torres, and on a human level, we can start bridging people back uh, in a very, very kind of subtle way. Uh, that here's somebody that uh, you actually probably came to see Paul McCartney or Marvin Gaye or, or your famous rock people, but the center of this film is a person that you may not want to have met before. And now you're meeting him and he's uh, drawing you through his life story with the backdrop of all these, all your favorite rock and roll artists. So my hope is that through that way of entertaining, we're actually helping with, with um, in a, in our small way, so a positive social change to introduce on a human level. And that actually was a, is a principle that was taught to many of us at the Producers Guild of America, the Power Diversity Workshop, that I, I think I've mentioned earlier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, that was great. That was everything I wanted to ask. I, I always like to close these interviews by asking if there's anything I should have asked. What do you think people, folks should know about either your movie or Ben Fong Torres or anything else? What 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 do you think? Uh, what did I fail to ask during this interview? You actually didn't fail to ask anything except for I would like to say I uh, plan to work on an educational version uh, to help uh, aspiring journalists and also maybe mid-career journalists uh, on what Ben 
was uh, talking about, which is not in the current film, and and even Cameron Crowe is talking about, and there's another female, there's a female named Holly George Warren, one of the most prolific uh, writers of rock and roll, um, and she started as a research assistant to Ben years ago. So what they learned from Ben on what it takes to be a professional journalist, uh, it, it, doing the hard work of fact finding, which is what we did for uh, uh, for Ben <laughs> in his film. Yeah, uh, that's interesting. That is interesting. I think that would be a, a I, I, I know that would be I would have loved to have had something like that in in college or even even a little bit later. It's always nice to get some good tips. On that sort of thing. Yeah, no, uh, seriously. It, 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 yeah. The world has changed even in in uh, in news gathering. It, it, there's this blur going on. What What is opinion news versus, or opinions versus the hard news, you know, the, the actual fact finding. So uh, I'm a member of a journalism group. And um, fortunately, I had um, uh, two really amazing um senior editors with the la times overseeing some of my early source material so they 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 really gave me some really great insight as well yeah uh well suzanne thank you very much for being on the show i really appreciate it again uh the the name of the movie like a rolling stone uh the life and times of ben fong torres go check it out on netflix it, it's uh it's easily it's easily found. Just, just search for it on your on your app. You'll you'll get it. It's, it's really it's something else. I again as somebody who uh, you know he, Ben Fongtor is a little bit before my time, but I'm as a student of that era of Rolling Stone and and journalism and and the culture. Uh, it was fascinating to take a take a trip back there. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Uh, my name is Sonny Bunch. Uh, I am culture editor at The Bulwark, and I will be back next week with another episode of The Bulwark Goes to Hollywood. See you guys then. Just getting started with Susie Schuster has stories of humble beginnings and humbling moments from inspiring people. Angela Kinsey. Listen, I, I was on set one day on The Office and I was like, we were talking about what's your good Switch. side. And I said, there's nothing really to that, right? That's like, oh, no, there is. And our camera operator, Matt Sohn, that I had known for eight years, and I go, Matt, what's my side? He was like, this side. I was like, seriously? Oh. He goes, yeah. He goes, I always try to frame you that way. I was like, why didn't you tell me seven years ago? The new Just Getting Started with Susie Schuster. Listen wherever you get your podcasts.